the modern compact between science and the state uh, provides uh, public funds to support research and protection from, uh, to a degree, uh, from uh, political meddling with the content of science on condition that science reciprocally should stay clear of politics, which seems at first a harmless constraint for what could be political about the formation and breakdown of atmospheric ozone, the dynamics of ocean currents, or the, or the neurological development of the fetus. Yet, of course, these and many other uh, topics uh, are in fact politically charged and in our technological age, uh, science is forever, forever spilling over the confines of the technical into spaces with serious financial or ideological implications. But the typical response of science has been to reaffirm its asceticism in the form of a claim to, uh, to objectivity defined by laboratory method methods, instrument reading, statistical uh, computations, and mathematical models. Uh, this means, according to the ideal of scientific self-restraint, uh, reporting the facts and leaving interpretation to others. But since scientific facts often do not speak directly to matters at issue, this ideal may leave the science powerless in regard to questions that matter. And I might just uh, note here that um, the issue of, uh, of trust I'm concerned with is not mainly, though, though, though this can't quite be separated out, not mainly whether you know, the public trusts the, uh, the results that science claims about nature, but what scientists, what the scientific uh, role permits um, the scientists to speak uh, about and, and to expect to be trusted. Now, crucially, there's also an element of fiction in the notion of wholly impersonal facts. Um, this has often posed problems for established science. I will well remember encountering as a, as a graduate student a paper by my advisor, uh, Charles Gillespie, uh, about, um, uh, about challenges to academic, uh, you know, established science during the French Revolution uh, coming from the crafts, and then he uh, used the word for what these guys were doing, he called them crafty, which um, he meant that this is how their cognitive pretensions uh, would have seemed to the savants and maybe also in the context of public life. Uh, the modern ideals of science have been formed in part to repress this kind of craft and replace craftiness with that truth to nature, factuality, uh, freedom from prejudice and fair-mindedness implied by scientific objectivity. Uh, for the modern field of science studies, or STS, uh, any separation of, of, of science and technology from skill and, uh, in this sense, uh, craft is pure illusion. Uh, for Stephen Shapin, uh, the key role, uh, the skill of the, act, uh, of the scientist uh, has much in common with that of the auto mechanic. If anything, scientific work is even less standardized and more local. For while auto mechanics in a world of mass production face a limited range of possibilities, every scientific lab has its own uh, research style. Uh, putting aside all craftiness, uh, Shapin argues that the intense skill and local knowledge of the scientists demand our trust, uh, which we are willing, uh, which we which we willingly uh, give, uh, in the, for the same reason that we trust our uh, our physicians and 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 garage mechanics. Uh, clearly, he has been lucky with auto mechanics and surgeons. Uh, but he's right uh, to note that behind the supposed impersonal knowledge of science, as behind the wizard's screen in Oz, is something very human, uh, very mortal an assortment of local settings where fallible people uh, practice their crafts. Uh, the textbook representation of the work of science does not emphasize so much the craft dimension, preferring instead an image of machine-like precision, of precision tools and precision instruments operated by expert experimentalists working according to a plan. It seems a quintessentially universalist, and in, on this point, science studies uh, view of precision tends in the same direction. Uh, Norton Wise comments in the introduction to his edited volume, The Values of Precision, that while qualities do not travel uh, well beyond the local communities where they are culturally valued, quantities seem to me be more easily transportable, and the more precise, the better. Unless I seem to be distancing myself from this, it's also you know, one of the key central arguments in my book, uh, Trust in Numbers. Uh, to be sure, uh, uh, as uh, Norton Wise recognizes, uh, this ability to travel depends on moving in a familiar world, a world formed by that jealous god precision in its own image. 
precision extends over a country by replicating the social and economic conditions that formed it. And a vast infrastructure of metrologists, inspectors, and technicians is required to sustain it. In another world, its career would be like the strictly classified sequel to Mark Twain's uh, peon to technology, uh, uh, the Harvard MBA in Saddam Hussein's court, the story of a business executive who tries to bring the advantages of technological efficiency and rational choice to a conquered land and is defeated by invisible opposition, a broken infrastructure, and clan loyalty. A precision also is a matter of skill, patience, and craft. That is, there's, we can't actually, we don't actually in the end want to put these at opposite uh, at poles and, and, and suppose they don't intersect with each other. Uh, think of poor Michan, the, um, uh, the astronomer and surveyor uh, for France and humanity, uh, who set out in, uh, uh, in the early years of the French Revolution as part of the effort to measure the meter, the base of the new uh, metric system, uh, you know, uh, wonderfully um, portrayed in Ken Alder's book uh, on the measure of all things. And Michan, in the end, was driven to distraction by an error of a few seconds of arc, uh, which he could not correct, in part because uh, by the time he did it, the border between uh, France and, uh, he was, he, it was on the border between France and Spain, and France and Spain were at war, and they weren't too eager to have surveyors going through and, uh, and, and, and getting the exact uh, locations of thing. Michan's uh, desperation and madness exemplify, in a way, the aspect of science uh, stressed by Michael Polanyi, not just, not, not automatic precision, but an intense devotion to the craft, precision as a craft. Polanyi, whom we've uh, already uh, heard about uh, more than once, wait, is Phil Morosky here? <laughs> Anyhow, um, um, uh, a chemist and philosopher and a severe opponent of the Soviet model of, uh, was a, a chemist and philosopher and a, a severe opponent of the Soviet model of applied science. Polanyi coined such titles as personal knowledge and the tacit dimension, emphasizing that scientists must be left free to follow their intuitions in choosing research problems and methods of solution. More specifically, he put his confidence in the community of science, which he said is self-organizing in the same sense that a capitalist economy is self-organizing. So actually, I, I, don't, I don't see him as exactly merging science with the economy, but, 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 but developing a, a strong analogy between the, uh, between the, the, the use of, uh, of local uh, knowledge and community organization within these, these two different kinds of institutions. This um, self-organizing character, we might say, depends on, an ideal, uh, in, uh, depends on an idealized version of capitalism as well as of science. It is to the advantage of any economic system if it can nurture rather than squash or rationalize away local initiative and the expert knowledge of specialist communities. Uh, the progress of science, even of precision, involves a shifting balance of mechanization and craft. The last reliable decimal place in a measurement is often purchased at very high cost, and the laboratory that can achieve it may have to be correspondingly large. But such a laboratory will be permeated by non-replicable skills of many sorts, joining forces to combat sources of error that uh, proliferate relentlessly as the scale of variability at issue becomes ever uh, smaller. Uh, yet uh, many important components of this work uh, will be pretty fully automated in the form of uh, atomic clocks, uh, sensitive balances, centrifuges, thermometers, and so on. Often, too, a program of measurement will incorporate the power of numerous uh, repetitions, that is, uh, statistics, thus joining brute force to exquisite craft in the clock-like regularity of the statistical recorder. Uh, and the automated portions of the work are forever expanding. Brilliantly original but quirky and unreliable techniques get their rough spots sanded down and the conditions within which they work are more fully uh, defined. Skilled practices become routine and may, in effect, be incorporated into an instrument. The cutting edge precision to which scientists of one generation devote every effort will often, in the next, be purchased off the shelf from a supply house and incorporated unthinkingly into work in, in remote fields by people who don't even understand how the instrument works. By now, this kind of tr precision is transported readily. That is, this is when, when precision uh, really, really travels uh, easily in both material and textual form. That is, both that you can you know, get an excellent scale and, uh, and with a, a modest skill uh, get extremely precise values and also uh, that you can read these numbers and incorporate them into your own work, perhaps. 
Precision machine reforms the nucleus of a system of standardization that is spread over much of the world, an artificial world in which travel is easy. As with Ann Tyler's accidental tourist who leaves home reluctantly and wants every foreign location to be as much like Baltimore as possible, you can get Starbucks coffee, replace the battery in your watch, and pick up email on a Blackberry almost anywhere you go. Uh, numbers form the heart of knowledge in an age of information. Uh, they make it possible to, to see like a state, uh, which means extensively and not too profoundly. As the Israeli political scientist Yaron Ezrahi put it, uh, information is knowledge flattened out and simplified. As information, that is to say, if it's going to be information, it should require little by way of interpretation and thus presume no deep intellectual preparation, but be immediately available to almost anyone for do-it-yourself use. Information presumes a world full of self-similar objects and of inhabitants who are familiar with them. Um, um, as in those old American IQ tests, which, uh, which uh, attributed feeble-mindedness to anyone unfamiliar with Crisco, pocket knives, and golf. <laughs> information must travel readily. Uh, to allow it to do so requires uh, technologies of distance. And it is for this reason, I think, that information often assumes a numerical form. Numbers, after all, can be incorporated readily into a mode of analysis governed by formal pr principles of arithmetic or statistics. When asked, as an illiterate Henry Smart is asked in Roddy, Roddy Doyle's novel uh, 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 with, 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 uh, uh, of that name, uh, what, when asked what's two plus two, we do not need to ask two of what. Usually it does not matter whether the units in question are atoms or humans, meters, money, or mental test scores. Oh, brave new world that has such numbers in it. The world was, this world was not made in a day, but has grown up as an alliance of rationalized bureaucracy, standardized production, and quantitative rules. It is amazingly robust, but it can be sub subverted. It's customary now to distinguish precision from accuracy, and I am going to do that as well. Precision is the quality of being definite and unambiguous, which need not signify correctness. I might, for example, be given very precise directions with street names, compass angles, and distances to the nearest centimeter, including minute descriptions of elevators, halls, and doors to travel uh, to the CBC from my hotel. Uh, yet, if written by some Canadian Mephistopheles, they might direct me instead to who knows what terrors of Toronto. Accuracy implies the validity of a number in regard to the location, quantity, or magnitude of a thing. Accurate instructions would have to take me to the right place. Precision requires nothing more than a tight clustering of the measurements, which, like bullet holes made by a marksman with a bias, may be very near to each other but some distance from the bullseye. The densest concentration of shot in the vice president's hunting partner will yet bring down no quail. <laughs> we should understand that the pursuit of precision is not a timeless feature of scientific knowledge and has perhaps been more closely associated with practical life. I don't actually want to press that distinction, but I do want to em emphasize that much precision has very practical purposes. Plato was a famous believer in mathematical reality, but Plato's cave did not allow the, this pure world to be experienced by the empirical observer. Precise measurement was more important to Babylonian astrology and to the modest Greek effort to save the <coughs> phenomena with uh, non-physical mathematical constructions than to the geometrical science of the heavens. In Christian Europe, calculating the dates of movable feasts, such as Easter, gave an added incentive, along with astrology, for, uh, for precise measurement. Uh, precise counts became important in the human sciences to assess the effects of smallpox inoculation and to measure the capacity of a nation to conduct war. Beginning about 1805, the method of least squares provided a standard for the assessment of scientific precision and the management of error. Meanwhile, a new system of mass production with standardized parts made precision economically important. Issues of technology provided the principal incentive for the new bureaus of standards that grew up from the late 19th century in you know, every industrialized country. But precision has become a mathematical topic, addressed in a specialist way by fields like statistics and metrology. Our modern understanding of precision since the early 19th century requires as its twin a sense of the rational management of error. When Lavoisier added 0.86886673 pounds of vital error 
to 0.1313327 pounds of inflammable gas to give 1.0000000 pounds of water. We say that however great the care he took to try to get accurate results, and he was a very careful experimenter, he failed in his understanding of precision. Those weights were accurate at best to a few significant figures, and it would be lost labor to expend great effort trying to control some source of error that only affected the, the, the sixth or eighth, or eighth uh, decimal. To be sure, scientists still may, still may regard the control of small errors as a requirement of conscientious practice of their, of their craft. But then they depart from precision as the handmaiden of accuracy, and even of precision in quest of efficiency, uh, uh, preferring, choosing a moral and in a way irrational uh, 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 ideal, uh, though to be sure linked to a scientific economy of trust. That is to say, a sense of doing the best practice in every dimension of the measurement, even if some dimensions of the measurement are, don't really have any consequences for the final result. In public and administrative uses, the role of numbers as a technology of distance and by implication of uh, trust or distrust is all the more fundamental. The transformation of knowledge into information uh, with the attendant obscuring of subtleties that demand interpretation uh, makes objective numbers suitable for widespread diffusion. Tallying a population, uh, for instance, depends on many fussy details of definition such as what counts as a place of residence and how it matters whether someone is a citizen and whether uh, they are present legally. It depends also on how the count is administered, <coughs> including what efforts are made to identify those who do not send in their forms or cannot be found at home. Although census officials recognize uh, that, each, that such indeterminacies can mount into the millions, uh, they give population figures to the last unit. And the expectation of random errors of a much smaller order is among the factors invoked against use of probability sampling in place of a, of a complete count, uh, in that, which was uh, rather famous in the 2000 US census. The last five digits of a population tally are uh, often meaningless, as meaningless as the last digits of Lavoisier's weights. But who has the status to discard results of an exhaustive count? Similarly, a company's balance sheet can change in a restructuring, sometimes by billions of dollars. Yet such ambiguities do not prevent the accountants from trying to deal properly with much smaller figures, and failure to do so could send them to prison. Accuracy can be elusive in relation to quantities like these but the rules and conventions governing them do produce a kind of precision. The precision of accounts indeed is of the highest order since their books must balance to the penny. Uh, Charles Sanders Peirce once remarked that the vaunted precision of physics, falling far short of that of bankers, was on the order of upholsterer's measurements, leaving little corners of uncertainty where the effects of pure chance might be tucked away. Index numbers such as the cost of living or inflation and, or inflation and deflation of the currency involve sampling and so cannot attain to absolute precision. Yet the numbers are always much more precise and determinate than the concepts or even the entities. That is to say, even the entities often have a certain you know, ambiguity at, the, in, in, at, at some point. Uh, the numbers are, all, are always much more price, uh, pr precise uh, than the uh, concepts and often the entities they purport to measure. Their preciseness follows from the rules and practices of measurement and depends on the credibility of the agencies that gather up and process the data. Assessing the effects of technological change has been particularly thorny. Uh, in the United States, the Boskin Commission in 1996 recommended an alteration of the index on the, uh, of, of inflation on the order of a percentage point per year. Uh, protests by pensioners uh, who received annual adjustments based on these numbers assured that no such uh, recalibration would be uh, uh, enacted. And the existence of indeterminacy on this scale has not prevented experts in economic measurement from attending assiduously to much smaller quantities. Such an important measure cannot be left to amendment by personal judgment or arbitrary whim. That is to say that precision has its <coughs> demands, which goes beyond any pretension, of, any pretension of accuracy. And that says something about the standing and the legal situation of the people who any people who could, uh, who, could, who, who could fuss with those numbers or who could decide to neglect something. The emergence of des decision technologies such as cost-benefit analysis illustrates the complex dynamic of precision and accuracy 
in relation to objectivity and discernment, or information and wisdom. Here again are numbers performing a legal or bureaucratic uh, function. By 1965, it had, had, the cost-benefit analysis had emerged as an I ideal for the analysis of government expenditures and regulatory actions of all kinds, a way of purging the corrupt play of interests from the decisions of government, uh, which should instead be objective and rational. That is, these decisions should be turned into problems of measurement and, and, cal and calculation, leading to information. Precision in cost-benefit studies uh, never pretended to absolute exactitude. The engineers who normally performed them, and these are the same engineers uh, 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 who uh, 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 figured in Wes's uh, 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 story uh, uh, yesterday, four such agencies as, as the Army Corps of Engineers and the United States Bureau of Reclamation, uh, at least through the 19, 1950s, were inconsistent in their use of rounding, but they did not claim more than two significant figures in the final result. And when the politics shifted or matured, it was quite possible for a dismal benefit-cost ratio of 0.37 to 1 to rise above 1.0 by adding, say, hydroelectric generation facilities uh, that, despite these wonderful advantages, had not been incorporated into the project in the first place. Eventually, the pressure of challenge by powerful opponents, uh, some of them from private industry, such as electric utilities and railroads, and some of them, for, I mean, maybe the most effective ones from rival agencies, caused the rules of measurement to be spelled out more clearly. This was achieved by rival experts confronting the public engineers and challenging their numbers in detail. Even after this process of codification was well advanced, the decision process continued to depend as much on forming an alliance of uh, supporters as on objective economic considerations. Yet the objective economic considerations, that is the numbers, had a definite formal role in the approval uh, process, and those <coughs> authoritative numbers could be most valuable for settling disputes in a dignified way, or uh, ideally avoiding the disputes altogether. Since nobody knew just what was to be measured, this was a matter of precision, well, I, I say not accuracy, precision as well as accuracy, but uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the point of controversy, I would say it was definitely precision. Uh, what the engineers needed was well-established rules of measurement and of conversion into commensurable units, i.e. Uh, dollars. Those rules might be largely conventional. Economic rationality was of interest, but that would not be but, but that would be out of reach until one could gain control of the pork barrel impulse, uh, or, well, uh, which, 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 which is always fundamental, uh, be, uh, fundamental in this story. Congressmen funding, uh, funding projects to win support of their districts and to enrich their key supporters or even themselves are always lurking in the background. A choice based on criteria that were somewhat arbitrary but rigorous might be preferred to one aiming to advance rational goals that could not easily be standardized and measured. This last point can be illustrated by the rules for measuring the value of human life. This has always been a, a touchy issue because even economists might be uncomfortable putting a price on a particular life and people in other, uh, other uh, careers, uh, leaving aside, um, well, people in other careers find the whole matter loathsome and heartless. We think of uh, Jonathan Swift's uh, bitterly ironical modest proposal, which pretends to demonstrate the economic advantages of serving up Irish children uh, at rich households in England. Yet in a system where a dam, a highway, or a hospital is required by law to get over a benefit cost hurdle by showing a ratio above 1.0, to refuse to put, to put a value on life is in effect to assign it a value uh, of zero. Since the 18th century, certain uh, institutions had found reasons to place a value on human life. These were life assurance companies. I neglect the mafia for the moment. <laughs> for which the point was to, co to compensate widows and orphans of professionals such as ministers for the financial loss they would suffer from the death of the father and breadwinner. If his future income and his annual expenses were known, along with rates of return on a safe investment, an actuary could calculate the sum desired. Uh, by the 20th century, uh, determinations of this kind were made routinely by, by life insurance companies. Since they involved the future, they could not be perfectly accurate, but statistics applied to an average life rather than a specific one uh, uh, tightened up the calculation. 
Often, there was more uncertainty in estimating the number of lives saved or lost as a result of constructing a levy or regulating a toxic substance than in the value to be assigned to each. The only problem with this measure was that economists, at least, who took these calculations more seriously than engineers, regarded it as completely the wrong quantity. What does a life insurance number have to do with what it should be? Uh, what, what, what we should, how we should value the life of somebody who is, killed, is going to be killed or saved uh, by some construction uh, project. But its advantage in terms of precision and objectivity outweighed this problem. Though eventually uh, we see the triumph of the economist's preferred standard when the uncontrollably div divergent measures of the trade-offs of risk and incomes uh, were tamed through the miracle of averaging. So uh, when they found a way to get a number in the right ballpark using their preferred method. They took that, but until that happened, they used the, the totally wrong measure just because it produced a number that they could work with. Since the time of Kant, and uh, I echo uh, uh, Phil Morofsky now, science has been associated with an enlightenment ideal of speaking truth to power. Often, though, the best it can do is speak precision to power. Precision, indeed, is a kind of power, often highly rationalized and sometimes insensitive, to that domain of nuance that might be synonymous with truth, trying, when it is not a smokescreen, to rein in power in the guise of arbitrariness, self-interest, corruption, superstition, and blind tradition. Some critics have seen excessive rationalization or precision run amok as more terrible than wild irresponsibility. I don't agree, but I wouldn't idealize the absolute role of, rule of precision either. It has its own arbitrariness, which follows from its most essential attribute of being or appearing to be radically impersonal. Precision is attached to a different form of trust, uh, one based on escaping from subjectivity and on rising above mere craft. It prefers mathematics with its relative freedom from, from context over loose argument. Uh, this is reasoning that should go by itself, based as much as possible on a rigorous language supplemented where necessary by rules and conventions. The agent of such measuring isn't, it can't be altogether undiscerning, but too much subtlety begins to sound like uh, craftiness. Is this ideal of rigor in language a triumph of the ideals of science? I prefer not to see it, not to see it as expressing the intrinsic character of scientific reasoning, but rather as the outcome of a cultural and political and scientific process that has reshaped science, even as science has collaborated in remaking our world. It is not necessarily what champions of science have wanted. Consider the case of Carl Pearson, in many ways the founder of the mathematical field of statistics, about whom Cerny points out we've already heard something at this uh, conference, and about whom I wrote my uh, most recent book. Uh, Pearson was an unflagging advocate of science, especially of quantitative science, for which he was a, a, an absolute missionary, echoing Leibniz, who said that in cases of controversy, the proper challenges, gentlemen, let us calculate, Pearson called on critics of his statistical arguments to furnish their own. Statistics on the table, please, he said. And yet his ideal of the proper role of science, which he explained in his book, The Grammar of Science, involved a joining of humanistic and scientific reason of wisdom and calculation. He used grammar to refer to basic instruction and reasoning, and his title revealed his desire that the fundamentals of science should take over the, the educational role hitherto occupied by grammars of Greek, uh, of Greek and Latin. At the very time he wrote this grammar, which was also when he first took up statistics as his calling, he was engaged with a controversy about the future of the University of London, in which he explicitly and repeatedly defended the ideal of the medieval university. Later, he tried to recreate it in his biometric laboratory, which rejected all learning from textbooks in favor of direct contact with the highest developments of science, aided by close daily interaction with the master, which happened to be himself. This was a celebration of craft and of wisdom, not of mechanical reasoning. But we should recognize the ambiguity here. Pearson lived with one foot in each world, or both feet in both worlds, and he did much to advance the more mechanical form of reason which goes with precision when accuracy is not available. That is, when the real concept at issue 
he eludes measurement. So that on the one hand, he is uh, uh, defending the, uh, the character of the scientist as a bearer of wisdom who should be able to make sensible, uh, uh, sensible reasonable uh, choices. On the other hand, um, when people criticized his statistics, he, never was, he was never willing to say, um, well, we consider these other considerations as well. He said, statistics on the table, please, meaning you produce your statistics, and if you have yours, then we can talk. But uh, he's not going, that is, he wants, he wants it all, and he's, he's trying to get it all into the quantitative idiom, and that is certainly what his, uh, what his legacy uh, entailed. By now, scientists and the public alike have learned to think of scientific knowledge in terms of a strict controlled reason governed by experimental and mathematical demonstrations. In that form, science has gained a more or less statutory role in certain confined uh, types of public decisions. In therapeutic trials, about which we've also heard uh, here, the protocol requires a certain controlled experimental situation and results that meet a standard, a, a statistical standard of effectiveness. Of course, craft is always lurking there, but craft is its Achilles heel since it, its acceptance <clears throat> depends on trust and skill as opposed to well-standardized mechanisms and commensurable measures. That is to say, the points where craft uh, is, has explicitly entered in, uh, it, uh, one can be accused of, of, of craftiness, and, that's, and, and that will be a weak point uh, in the argument. Impersonal scientific precision has become the gold standard of public reason. And in a culture of distrust, who can now speak of wisdom without laughing? Our experts have been caught in their own net. They should speak authoritatively or not at all. And so there is much on which they must remain silent. We demand absolute trust or, 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 or we dismiss it. The great danger of the self-denying form of scientific objectivity is an ironical outcome of its popular success. Generations of students have been introduced to science as a thing apart, defined by a rigorously quantitative method of gathering data and testing hypotheses. In this discourse, creative insight was reduced to a role in the forming of hypotheses, but never in their validation. And craft skill is rarely mentioned. That is a very high standard of impersonal reasoning, uh, really an impossible standard. A distinguishing feature of the modern subversion of public science is to pretend to take this ideal seriously and to show how actual research involving, for example, environmental or public health dangers falls short, that is to say, where it's not perfectly rigorous, which whatever is. The buzzword these days is sound science. And by the, uh, the, I echo a bit Chris Mooney, uh, uh, who I think on this point is quite, is, is quite, uh, quite nice. Uh, the buzzword these days is sound science, wielded often by self-interested actors who let on that those who depart from this true method of science must be incompetent or corrupt. Not academic postmodernists or social constructivists, but research institutes sponsored by tobacco and oil companies have most effectively challenged or befogged the public, um, the public voice of science. <clears throat> Anything less than rigorous demonstration, they claim, that reduces to mere opinion or even corruption, which cannot provide an adequate basis for decisions that will harm business interests uh, their own. Doubt is our product, in the immortal words of a tobacco company executive, and doubt can be sown anywhere. The campaign for sound science is at bottom an effort to discredit science, or at least to fashion a weapon by which any particular finding can be discredited if a wealthy institution finds sufficient advantage in doing so. The retreat of science into what is called its proper domain of impersonal facts and laws, uh, what I've called the modern compact, no longer insulates science from economic and political forces, uh, to the extent it ever did. Of course, that insulation was never absolute, and neither was the withdrawal of science from politics. These days, the natural and social sciences, including technological and medical fields, have an important role with regard to almost every public issue. The results of research on suspected industrial carcinogens or the health and environmental impacts of genetically modified crops and in 10,000 other areas bear directly on policy questions. And no principle of scientific neutrality can conceal this relationship. The current American administration provides a particularly favorable environment for challenges to and subversions of uh, institution, you know, established elite science. But the problem will, will not simply go away when it does. 
The interests affected by science have come to see advantage in trying to manipulate scientific outcomes, that is, to engage with the technical domain, rather than waiting until the data are in and scientific conclusions are drawn and then contesting policy implications only. And uh, given the way the, the, the scientific role works, it would be, I mean, if they wanted to affect the process, they have to uh, engage themselves at that level. This should not be surprising. Often their challenges are disturbingly dishonest, uh, but, um, but we have learned to expect uh, this of, uh, of much that is debated in the public, uh, in, in the political sphere. Social science, which never secured the same degree of protection from political suspicion as, as natural science, has regularly been swept up into a world of demagoguery and pandering. And yet it would be complacent indeed to presume that any critique of scientific claims from outside the elite scientific community must be ill-informed or self-serving. That is, there has to be a way of taking it taking it seriously without, uh, without um, you know, without uh, having to accuse the scientists of fraud and without, uh, on the other hand, without treating every claim as equal. There is more hope in raising the standard of public discussion of science than in trying to shut off debate. Now, the relation of science to public reason seems now to be undergoing uh, a critical shift away from the 20th century idealization of disciplinary autonomy and rigorous objectivity. New scientific practices, including uh, more and more reliance on modeling in order to deal with complexity, have participated in this shift. In the study of climate change, for example, science means at once a drive to get the best possible data and to comprehend rigorously what can be so comprehended, a set of models involving diverse communities of researchers to reveal the structure and outcome of an immensely complex process, and at the end of it all, reason discussion within and outside disciplinary communities to interpret uh, the results. Um, if only it were possible, but science uh, can no longer be protected from politics by asceticism. And it behooves us, I think, as scientists and scholars to enter more openly, and at the same time more modestly, into the public sphere. Thanks. <laughs>